it's been a while. I've <laughs> I've been busy and very lazy. <clears throat> I am still kind of waking up, so bear with me. <clears throat> Hello, my name is Vistraz. I'm the reason for your satanic panic and all that fun shit. <laughs> We are going to be talking some D&D shit today. Basically, how to game master, dungeon master, all that fun stuff. We're going to be going over stat blocks and how to read them, how to use them, how to modify them. We've got a couple of uh, stat blocks here we'll go through. <coughs> and I'm still kind of waking up, so things are, things are loose. Um, and I will be sounding like I'm dying here for a, a solid moment. Um, gonna move some notes around. All right. So let me bring up. Oop, that's not it. Okay, now I'm making myself invisible. This is what happens when I'm not wide awake. There we go. Let's get myself over here. Is the music too loud? I'm just gonna turn that down a wee bit so uh, it's not over overtaking me. I bring this up here. <clears throat> All right. So, how do you read this thing? It looks like a bunch of information that you don't know what to do with. Well. <clears throat> We'll jump right into it and talk about the most obvious thing. Uh, over here, I don't know. Yeah, you can see my mouse. You have your name, your type, small humanoid, and uh, their alignment. <coughs> oh my god! Excuse me. Uh, that's the generic stuff. Name, type, alignment. Um, you're gonna look at the top of this thing mainly for anything that uh, spells that target specific um, humanoids, beasts, dragons, uh, aberrations, undead, all that information is going to be up here. Uh, alignment is kind of flavor text at this point. Um, I don't know why they, uh, at least in campaigns I've done, we don't really listen, we don't really use alignment anymore. So it's a little strange, I guess, to me that we still have alignment up there. Um, I haven't really used alignment since 3.5, but hey, you guys probably do. Or if you don't, I don't know. Let me know. Do you guys use alignment at all in your uh, in, in your games? Um, is this okay? Um, so moving on down from there, we have your ass. Your armor class, hit points, and speed, or your AHS. Armor class should be clear as day. Hit points, it'll give you the, the average amount. This is taking the average of the dice rolls here. So this is 2d6, so it's 3. 2d6, uh, average will be 3. Um, sometimes they'll tack on some extra just to fluff the health. But your what's displayed here is usually the average. If you want to max that, that health, take the maximum amount from the dice and uh, throw it on there. A good rule of thumb when you're DMing, if you want something super simple, like super uh, simple of an encounter, take the average or you can use, uh, you can lower it to like the minimum. Maybe not ones. It's like in, in the case of the 2d6 here, you could just let it be seven because at fifth or tenth level your characters are going to be clearing through goblins pretty easily <clears throat> if you want it to be a really simple challenge and just give these goblins like i don't know three health so they're cannon fodder and you're just clearing through waves of of enemies 2d6 okay they start with it, it's two ones and a one so you get three health one hit should kill them right away Speed is almost never really going to change unless your characters are using spells like uh, Ray of Frost, which can reduce speed. Um, 
This is just your reference point. <coughs> Pardon me for that. Uh, <coughs> I had to snap my neck there to take a drink. Uh, <coughs> and finally, we, well, finally, what am I thinking? He, uh, we finally get to the like meat of the stat block. The stats. Your strength, dex, con, int, wiz, and charisma. Um, scores and modifiers. Um, saving throws are where you're going to want to be referring to this. Um, sometimes with skills, they only specify like a specific skill that they're good at. With That's just saying what they're good at. Unfortunately, it doesn't provide a whole list of what skills... Um, this creature could potentially be good with. <clears throat> so, it's always handy to have a spare character sheet with you. Um, if you are scrounging to remember what skills are at what. Um, I mainly do that because I forget quite often what skills are associated with which, uh, ability score. Um, so it's mainly... Oh shit, what does survival use again? Wisdom? Okay, this goblin has a negative one in wisdom. So their survival is going to be shit. Um, what we see here with stealth, it has a plus six, and stealth is a dex save, or a dex check, so they have a plus two. Their stealth skill, though, is going to overwrite the plus two, because they got the plus six. And if I'm wrong on that, please correct me. I don't, uh, I don't want to be feeding you misinformation. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, let's go on from there. Below that, it's a little awkward with the goblin character because um, it's like cut in half here. But this is all the characters slash like monster background info. So kind of like the uh, background that you choose for your character. Uh, has skills, their senses, languages, and finally their CR or challenge rating and their proficiency bonus. I don't know what is going on, but my ears are just killing me today. All right, so back to it. We talked a little bit about the skills. Uh, anything that they are good at will be listed here. So for the goblin, it's just stealth. Um, I have a lich here, which is we'll we'll touch on this in a minute here, but uh, lich has way more skills. So arcana, history, insight, perception. Vampires uh, have perception and stealth. Dragons, perception and stealth. Um, any skill they are like supposed to be good at will be listed in the skills block, and some of them can be a lot. Um, I don't, I don't think I've come across a stat block that has, like, a lot of skills. I think the max is, like, maybe five or six skills that a monster is, uh, proficient with. Below that is senses, uh, their dark vision and their passive perception. A lot of monsters have dark vision, and it's usually up to about 60 feet. Um, <clears throat> let's take a look at the lich here. So the lich has a bit more, and we'll cover, uh the rest of these here in a minute um, but Lich has True Sight and Passive Perception True Sight, uh, if you hover over this in D&D Beyond uh, you can see in normal and magical darkness you see invisible creatures and objects automatically detect visual illusions and basically it's the it's the cheat code for any any BS you're trying to pull with them um <clears throat> Senses will always have passive perception, what, what this creature is going to passively perceive if they're not trying to uh, investigate something. Um, vampires, again, just dark vision, a, a larger range, passive perception. Uh, dragons have blind sight. Um, they can perceive its surroundings without relying on sight, basically uh, uh, hearing, I guess. <clears throat> um... There is another sense called Tremor Sense, which is kind of like, uh, if you've ever watched Avatar, The Last Airbender, it's kind of like what Toph has. You can sense things moving through the ground. 
Um, a blind sight is kind of implied that they can hear it and or feel changes in the environment. Um, uh, so, but it does seem like blind sight is primarily relying on uh, uh, hearing. Damage resistances, immunities, and condition immunities. So goblins don't have any immunities or resistances. Liches do. Uh, vampires have some damage resistances. And dragons have some immunities. So we'll touch on the lich, who has damage resistances to cold, lightning, and necrotic. Excuse me. Oh my god. Uh, so, resistances. They will not be caused any damage by these damage types. So, your Ray of Frost, not going to do any damage. Lightning Bolt, won't do any damage. Necrotic damage, so your, um, uh, your Toll of the Dead, your, um, Finger of Death, won't do anything. Oh, I'm sorry. Wow, I am off my ball today. Resistance <laughs> means half damage. Half damage. They will take half damage. I'm thinking about immunities. Oh my god. I need to wake up. So cold damage. They will take half damage from your Ray of Frost. Lightning. They will take half damage from your Lightning Bolt. Uh, Finger of Death. They will take half damage from. Immunities. They are completely immune from. My brain is not online. I, I apologize for that misinformation. This is not... Ugh. How I wanted to do things. I wish I could drink coffee. Hopefully that would wake me up, but I doubt that very highly. So, like I confused you earlier, immunities. Goblins don't have any immunities. They are very basic creatures. Um, you can add immunities to them later uh, if you're homebrewing a creature. Um, we'll touch on that more uh, in a little bit. Um, so damage immunities for liches. Poison will do nothing. Bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing from non-magical attacks will do nothing. How do you know if your attack is magical or non-magical? It will usually state so. Uh, please read your, uh, your weapons description and your feature descriptions. Uh, the monk's uh, martial art ability, or their martial art feat, makes their attacks magical. I think that is either a feat at level 1 or I want to say level 5. I can't remember off the top of my head, and as we've clearly seen from this morning, I am not remembering things properly. But <clears throat> there is a feat for the monk that makes their um, their martial art attacks considered magical, including their weapon attacks. Please read your feats. Um, weapons will state if they are magical or if they don't state that they're magical, they are non-magical. <clears throat> Condition immunities. This means they cannot be charmed, exhausted, frightened, paralyzed, or poisoned. Um, <clears throat> so anything that would cause them to be frightened and run away, like a uh, frightful presence, not going to affect them. Um, <clears throat> a... I forget. Um, casting friends on a lich, nothing's gonna work, even if they fail their save. Um, it's kind of it kind of goes hand in hand with the damage immunity, but if you try to poison them, they they can't be poisoned, even if they fail the Constitution save. It's just not gonna happen. <clears throat> Vampires have damage resistances. I talked about that already. So necrotic, bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing will all do half damage. Um, now, if bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing damage comes from a magical weapon, it is considered uh, full damage. They won't take half, they'll take full. Um, dragons have damage immunity to fire. This one is an adult red dragon, so fire is kind of their thing. So it makes sense that it would be immune to fire damage. <clears throat> I know I'm jumping around kind of a little wild, um, with this particular section. The important thing to realize when you are reading these stat blocks 
uh, these little like red lines, they're they're there to help break it up. <clears throat> you are not supposed to read this entire thing and memorize it. I would not I would not bother myself to memorize all of this. You can have these behind your DM screen. Um in your uh, in your browser uh, while you're DMing. I usually have a stat block up if the um, turn-based tracker I'm using. Uh, I use improvedinitiative.com um, as my turn tracker. That usually has a um, that usually has a a sap block built into it. Let's see if I can pull it up here. <clears throat> so let's pull in a lich. So I'll just dump that in there. Hey, oh, how's that look? It looks a little wonky. Oh, let me see if I can fix that here. Hmm looks a little weird but so when I when I use improved initiative if I click on um, any any monster that I drop into the encounter this whole area is the encounter here it has the stat block condensed into the corner here and it covers the same amount of information as is on our stat block <clears throat> So, Legendary Resistance, three a day. Legendary Resistance, three a day, right there. <clears throat> uh, it is, they do have some variations, uh, like here. I just typed in Lich in the corner. I know this is kind of cut off, but they have a, a, uh, a Hierophant Lynch. Lich? Lynch? I can't talk. Um, I don't know what a Hierophant Lich is. They have a Lich Hound, a Pact Lich, and a Virtuoso Lich. I don't know what these are. <clears throat> um, it looks like it's the same thing. Lich Hound. Hematoma Beast, apparently. It's a Pact Lich. I wish they provided uh, photos with these. Some of them do, but um, some of them don't. <clears throat> but Improved Initiative is, is one of the combat trackers that I use, and they have the sap block next to them. So when I'm DMing, I can rely on this, or if it's a uh, monster that I don't think my turn tracker will have, I'll pull it up as a tab to look at. <clears throat> So, where were we on my notes? Uh, CR and proficiency. We covered the skills, senses, uh, languages is just kind of like fluff. Um, <clears throat> common plus up to five other languages. You as the DM are going to choose those five other languages. Uh, I would recommend pulling from your party. What languages can your party speak? That's going to be helpful for you. Um, the languages at New in Life. Uh, that's uh, for vampire. That's open to open to interpretation. I can talk. Of um, who is your vampire based off of? Like, are, are you basing this off of Count uh, Count Strad von Zarevich? I had to remember his name. He is a named NPC and has his own stat block. So let's actually pull him up. He's a good example. Wow, I can't talk. Stat block. <clears throat> do we have a stat block for him? Yes, we do. This is going to look a bit different than what we're used to. But that is Strahd's, uh, that is Strahd's stat block. It's a bit meatier than... Uh, than what we've been going over and it, you see it provides a nice picture of the uh the man 
<clears throat> and we will get down to more of these later. Um, I'm trying to cover all of these, and I know uh, the section here is going on a bit long. <clears throat> Challenge rating, basically, it provides your rule of thumb of how much experience you will get from killing this uh, encounter, this specific monster. So for a goblin, you're getting 50 XP. For a lich, you're getting 33,000, especially if it's a CR21 lich. Um, hopefully you are not taking that on until you are higher level. Uh, Strahd, 13,000. He is a CR15. Um, <clears throat> I will be honest, I don't know how Dungeons & Dragons calculates CR. I, I don't know what that is supposed to truly like define as. I don't know if anyone really does other than wizards. Um, <clears throat> if anyone understands the CR rating, please let me know. I'd love to I'd love to know how they manage that. Um, so CR is the general rule of thumb from my understanding of how difficult an encounter can be. The higher this XP, the more difficult it should be. Um, and ideally you want a full party of at least four people going up against uh, these challenges. Um, Stroud is not actually that much higher than a normal vampire. Normal vampire is CR 13. Stroud is a CR 15. A normal vampire is 10,000 XP. Stroud is 13,000. Stroud has a little bit more flavor to him with his with his stuff and that primarily primarily I think I'm having a stroke. <laughs> I'm not actually having a stroke. I'm having a okay, maybe maybe my fucking model is Jesus. Remind me not to drink water like that again. Uh, but Stroud has a bit more flavor to him, uh, mainly from the lair actions. And we'll touch on those again in a little bit. I'm touching on a lot of things that I need to just get to already. Uh, proficiency bonus. Whatever they should have proficiency in, which their stats should uh, say so, um, it will call for. Um, or it'll also help you factor um, your uh, how you got to your plus nine. Vampires with a self of plus nine, if they have it in their skills, they're good at it, which means the proficiency bonus, your plus five, is added to your dex bonus that gets you your nine. Perception is wisdom, so five, six, seven, there's your perception. <clears throat> or like say you give them a magical item that boosts a skill. Proficiency bonus plus that item. I don't know what happened. I think my brain just blanked for a moment. I'm having a moment. <clears throat> Let's move on. Special and normal actions. So, going back to our goblin, we'll start simple. Nimble escape. Nimble escape is a special action for the goblin. It is specific to goblins and goblinoids. Um, not all goblinoids have it, um, but standard goblins do. Nimble escape allows goblins to take disengage or hide as bonus actions on each of their turns. I use this ability a lot with my players. I will literally have my goblins my goblins, run up, try to hit my players, and then immediately run away. They always get pissed off by their snimble escape. I think the common phrase for goblins after they run up to my players, try to hit them, and then run away is, bitch. <laughs> Um, special actions for the Lich. These are your legendary resistances, rejuvenation, and spell casting. Any creature with a, uh, with a big enough stat block may have spell casting. <clears throat> Vampires are a bit different. Uh, they will have specific, um, actions like their shape changer, which allows them to change into... Uh, mist. Um, is this mist and bats, or is it just the mist? Okay. Um, for the vampire, it says 
Uh, it can polymorph into a tiny bat, a medium cloud of mist, or back to its true form. This is the shape changer ability. Provides all the information for uh, the shape changer action. Um, da, 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 da. These can be done inside or outside of combat. <clears throat> also provides its weakness. Um, the Lich doesn't really have that, but uh, the Vampire and Lich have two similar actions called Regeneration and Rejuvenation. Regeneration means a monster is going to regain hit points at the start of their turn, even if they take, even if they're down to at least one hit point. Um, regeneration may provide uh, guidelines as to what can trigger its rejuvenation and what can stop its reju regeneration. The Lich uh, with rejuvenation mainly states about how if the Lich is destroyed, it will return in 1d10 days so long as the party has not found its phylactery. <clears throat> Spellcasting will tell you what level of spellcaster the creature is. It'll provide you a list of spill spills. <laughs> provide you a list of spells that the creature knows on hand. If you're using D&D Beyond and hover over them, it'll tell you and give you the exact details of the spell. <clears throat> uh, please read. Let me uh, pull this over here. There we go, so you can see. Please read these. Especially pay attention to these slots. Um, spell save DC is in your spell casting description. These slots are no different than your wizard, sorcerer, or warlock spell slots. You can only cast that amount of spells. So, 9th, 8th, 7th, 6th, all of those have one spell slot. If you want to open up with the fight for the Lich with powered word, Power Word Kill, you do not have Power Word Kill for the rest of the fight. Be careful with your spells. For a while there, I would do this very thing when running a, an encounter with a Lich. I wanted to make it seem scary, so I would drop Power Word Kill at the start of an encounter, only to realize, ah fuck. I can't use it again because it's gone. So, <clears throat> please pay attention to these um, because there's a potential that someone in your party could be a rules lawyer and we'll call it out. <clears throat> uh, you are the DM, which means you get to uh, you get to change some rules, but. If you're spamming power word kill when a, a lich should only really have one slot, uh, it's gonna cause a bad time for your party. Uh, turn resistance. Liches are immune from being. Uh, liches are. Im well, not. I can read. I'm sorry, this is a horrible morning for me. I can read. Turn resistance. The lich has advantage on saving throws against any effect that turns undead. <coughs> So, uh, I'm going to take this moment to briefly go over everything we've covered so far. I wanted to start simple with the goblin, but I also wanted to show examples of um, other stat blocks. So, name, type, and alignment is your top right corner. Your ass, armor class, hit points, and speed. Um, this is default armor, what they will normally have on them. Hit points, this is your average. It will always be an average amount of health. If you want to crank that up, set your whatever dice it recommends for the health at max. Um, some like the Lich here have a plus number. Add that onto the max number of dice. Um, a lot of them can get pretty high up there. 17 D8, that's a lot of D8s. So an easy way to maximize the vampire's health is take what the max of the D, so it's 8, take 8 times 17, and then add your 68. Then you have a, a fully maxed out uh, vampire. Dragon. 
256 health. That's average. These are average health. Not full. Use this knowledge sparingly. Sometimes the average is enough for a normal encounter. A dragon with full 256 health is uh, going to be quite the battle. 19d12. So let me just do some quick math here. A dragon with full health. Not the average of 256. A red adult dragon with full health is 361 health. That is a fight and a half and probably ups this challenge rating. At least by one. <clears throat> so DMs, be aware of upping the health. Be aware of how much that can change the fight. <clears throat> um, speed will remain constant. Be aware of your characters using speed reducing um, abilities like Ray of Frost or features that um, inhibit speed. Your stats, um, the scores and modifiers, this is where you're going to be referring to anything uh, for skills that are not listed. Um, <clears throat> if a feature or ability from one of your party members affects the score you will refer to here but namely these will not really change <clears throat> skills what they're good at is usually adding their proficiency bonus to their uh the chosen skill now here the goblin has a plus six sometimes these don't always make sense like i said before like with the vampire here with a perception of plus seven that's their proficiency bonus plus the associated uh, skill. 5 plus 2 gives us the plus 7. But for some fucking reason, the goblin has a stealth of 6 when its proficiency is a 2 and its dex is a 2. It should only be a 4. Wizards is... Wizards is wizards, and they'll do what they want. So for some reason, the goblin has a plus 6 for stealth. But don't question it. You can fix it if you want to might also change your encounter where it might make the goblin weaker i usually run it as is it's not a big deal to me senses everything that this creature has by default you can add more to it if you're home brewing um if you're using D, &D beyond um if you have or it has explanations for every site or every uh sense that they have languages are common or languages are common Languages are fluff, uh, fluff character information. Um, allows you to, to figure out what um, means they can talk. Um, let's see, do we have one that has telekinesis? No. Uh, so if we look up mind flares, find a stat block here. I didn't want... Didn't, give me something I can read, please. Sure, that works. Another uh, another kind of odd uh, stat block that we're going to run into here is... Um, <clears throat> well, if you come down here to languages, you'll see deep speech, undercommon, and telepathy. Telepathy means they don't really need uh, to have a certain language. They can speak to your characters straight into their heads and your characters will understand them. <clears throat> Doesn't always mean that. It's kind of like a house rule, at least by my understanding. And if I'm wrong, please correct me. I don't want to be giving you guys misinformation. Um, so telepathy can be kind of like a cheat code, but please uh, look at your languages because telepathy, telepathy is important. get out of the combat tracker um and then finally cr and proficiency bonus cr is going to tell you how much experience this creature is going to give after you've defeated it and proficiency bonus is going to apply to any weapon or anything that this creature picks up anything that uh you modified or even what skills they could potentially be good at <clears throat> and 
Uh, the last thing we talked on was special actions. These kind of these features that are outside of the actions tab. It's these things that just sit outside and above the actions. There's spell casting, rejuvenation, legendary resistances, uh, special qualities to the specific creature. So, um, dragons have legendary resistance. A mind flayer has spell casting and magic resistance. Strahd has spell casting, spider climb, and has the weaknesses for him as a vampire. So finally, we'll get into actions. Actions are the standard actions this creature will take in combat. Their choices are a scimitar or a sharp bow. Um, my rule of thumb with, with uh, goblins, at least, if they are within five feet of a character, they're going to probably try to hit them with a scimitar. If they're anything beyond maybe 10 feet, they're going to pull out their short bow. Um, it depends on what you feel is best as a playstyle for these creatures. My my goblins are very much hit and run. Run up, hit my character, try and get away. Uh, liches. Liches have paralyzing touch. Um, it's a spell attack, but does not consume a spell slot. At least I don't think so. No. Um, deals cold damage and paralyzes the target if they fail a constitution saving throw. It's not bad. Um, this is kind of where the confusion can come in with uh, spells and spell-like abilities. Because this does not specifically say it uses a spell slot, I would say this is a spell-like ability. It's difficult to say. My my Me personally, I say this is spell-like ability. So it cannot be counterspell. It's treated as a spell melee spell attack. Um, but it does not say it's an outright spell. So if my characters wanted to counterspell the Paralyzing Touch... Let me, let me double check this real quick. It's Paralyzing Touch. I'm, not, I'm clearly not awake this morning, so I need to double check this. Is this a spell? So it is, it is unique specifically to the Lich, which means it would be a spell-like effect. So any of my characters wanting to counterspell or dispel Paralyzing Touch, I would say it would not work. That's a ruling from me. You as a DM can make an entirely different call. That is, that is something entirely up to you. But that is one of those things where it's treated as a spell attack, which is unique to the Lich. Um, so it's not technically a spell per se. Uh, vampires. What actions do they have? Multi-attack. If a creature has this at the top of their actions, they will most likely use this. And it'll tell you what they normally will use for their multi-attacks. They make two attacks, only one of which can be a bite. So what I read from this is cool. He's going to do two attacks. He's going to bite, and then he's going to do an unarmed strike. That's really about it for, for the vampire. Now, you don't have to use multi-attack. You can have him bite. You can have him just unarmed strike. You can have him charm. Um, melee is... Combat is however you want to do it. If you think multi-attack is doing too much damage, change it up. Um, I know in my campaigns recently I have taken full advantage of using a bugbear's uh, brutish attack, which has led to some really, really devastating rolls against my characters. And they have been near death about three times because of the brutish strike. Including me nearly killing my, my veteran DM, uh, who is usually kind of untouchable 
So be sure to take advantage of some of these actions. It's not unfair to take advantage of them. Um, so let's see, what's a dragon got for its actions? Multi-attack. Um, it can use its frightful presence. It then makes three attacks, a bite and two claws. It can seem unfair, especially if you're early in a campaign. That's where your challenge rating comes in. Be aware of that. A pack of goblins is going to make more sense than fighting a CR-17 adult red dragon that can make three attacks. A CR-17 adult red dragon probably shouldn't be tackled until you're, like, level 12 at the earliest. And I'm just using that from, like, Baldur's Gate. Because when I, when I went through Baldur's Gate and I encountered a dragon, my party was at least, like, level 11 or 12 when we encountered it. Sorry, I'm scratching my nose, so if I'm tweaking, that's the problem. But yeah, you, you want to be aware of your player levels and how it reacts to CR. There are calculators out there that help you calculate what would be best for a party of certain levels. Um, but just be aware that when a creature has multi-attack and it hits, it can hit hard. Um, <clears throat> tail attacks are an option your fire breath you know these are all part of the toolkit read them as it can kind of show how the intended play style of a creature is so looking at a dragon it's going to bite oh my god i'm sorry i'm tweaking here because my nose is is on fire i'm gonna grab a drink Okay, and have a seizure. <laughs> I don't know why it's freaking out like that. Um, <clears throat> so dragon's usually going to throw two claws and bite. Or bite, then throw two claws. It has an option for a tail attack. So you can have it just kind of turn around and throw its tail at the party. Um, Frightful Presence is usually at the start of an encounter. Um, because uh, once you pass a Frightful Presence save, you're not really affected by it anymore, which is why I say it's kind of a thing when you first encounter the dragon. Fire Breath, or any breath attack from a dragon. That's your, your kind of big ace in the hole with them. What does this mean by recharge five to six? That's how many times it can use it. Um, at least that's what I've interpreted it as. Recharge might be five to six turns. Let me let me check that. What does that mean? Okay, so I was wrong. I thought it was the number of times you could use it. That's not fully true, but according to the monster manual, recharge means a monster can use a special ability once and that, and that the ability then has a random chance of recharging during each subsequent round of combat. Um... Okay, As so once you, so like say the dragon uses its fire breath, at the start of each of the monster's turn, roll a d6. If the roll is one of the numbers in the recharge notion, so for the dragon to be a five or a six, um, that the monster regains the use of the special ability. The ability also recharges when the monster finishes a short or long rest. Um, so yeah, if the dragon uses its fire breath at the start of each of its turn, you roll a d6. If it's a 5 or 6, 
the dragon gets its fire breath back. So, hey, I learned something. I thought it was, uh, it can only use it five or six times. Nope. I learned something today. And I've been, I've been DMing for years. So, hey, you will always learn something. All right. So, legendary actions. These fun things. In short, TLDR, legendary actions are glorified reactions. Um, and they have costs. <clears throat> they have costs. Um, legendary action option can be used at any time and only at the end of another creature's turn. So, I say glorified reactions, but yeah. It's kind of like a, a an extra action, but on, you know, your buddy's turn. I feel like I'm doing such a shit job of explaining this today. Um, so, Paralyzing Touch, another, literally, it's attack. Costs two actions. Um, your legendary actions usually are about uh, three. Has three legendary actions as a vampire. Dragons have three legendary actions. That is your like default. I don't think there's a creature out there that has anything more than three legend three legendary reactions. Um. So. You have options to choose from. Casting a cantrip. Right over here. Main hand press digitation ray of frost. For lich, you're probably casting ray of frost. It's the only thing you can really attack with. Um, goblins don't have legendary reactions. They're kind of like a base creature. I think anything above CR 10? CR 10 has, magic, has legendary reactions? I'm not sure entirely. But each action has a cost. Uh, your bigger ones are costing two actions. Um, frightening gaze. And then your more powerful ones are going to cost all of your actions. Once you use all of them, once you use all these uh, legendary actions, you cannot use them again until the end of your creature's turn. So say the Lich takes its turn and does Paralyzing Touch and uses a legendary resistance to um, save on a spell effect. That's the end of its turn. Um... So the fighter in your group does their turn. Okay, well now he's going to use two legendary actions to use a paralyzing touch on the fighter. Two of his actions are gone. So now your ranger goes. Your ranger does their turn. At the end of their turn, Lich is going to use their cantrip to cast Ray of Frost on them. Hit or not, now the Lich can't use any more legendary actions because all three have been spent. So, you got through your fighter, you got through your ranger, your rogue's turn, they go through their turn, Lich can't do anything because the, the legendary actions are gone. Cleric goes, Lich can't do anything because legendary actions are gone. Lich's turn. Lich just paralyzing touch, you know, rinse and repeats. Um, end of its turn. Now it has three legendary actions again. So, that's how that works. Some of them are very simple, like the legendary actions for a vampire. Move. And an unarmed strike. Those two don't cost anything. A bite costs two actions. Well, let me correct myself. If it doesn't state a cost, it's considered one. That's why the cantrip on the Lich doesn't have one. That's one action. I even pretty much implied that. <laughs> so move and unarmed strike cost one each. So... He can strike, or bite, or move, and still have some actions left over. Dragon. What can they do? Detect tail attack and a wing attack. I gotta be honest, I haven't really looked at the dragon, uh, at least the red dragon. Um, Saplock? These, these kind of suck. 
These kind of suck for a dragon. I would think like a a breath attack for like three costs. That'd be that'd be kind of cool. That'd be that'd be cool. But those are legendary actions. Um, you take them at the end of other people's turn. That's why I call them glorified reactions. You're not really reacting, but you're getting in another opportunity to either reposition your your creature or um, get in one more attack. Strahd, let's look at him real quick for legendary action. He's the same as normal vampires. Mind flayers, this one doesn't have any legendary actions. But let's cover uh, the final um, final little section for stat blocks, lair actions. If you have a named character like Strahd here, um, they will have a lair. Dragons have lairs. Um, I'm surprised that the adult red dragon doesn't have... Is that the ancient dragon? Certain dragons have um, lair actions. Ancient red dragon, do you have lair actions? You don't. What the fuck? What the fuck? I thought dragons had lair actions. I'm sorry, I'm a little confused. Huh. I could have sworn I've seen in the monster manual that they had lair actions. I might be thinking of lair descriptions. Hmm. Okay. I am I am sadly mistaken. I'm trying to find something with a lair action other than our uh other than Strahd here. Ah, okay. Down here. So lair actions may not always be in the um on the stat block they'll sometimes be off on a different part of the page so for Strahd someone just included it and I think he I think it's included um, in the standard stat block in uh, the Curse of Strahd book but lair actions can be included on the stat block and basically it's um, it's actions that the environment can do to your to your party while uh, while in their den, their lair, obviously. Um, so an adult red dragon here. Magma erupts from a point on the ground that the dragon can see. Um, so you have environmental effects, tremors, gas, um, and then some regional effects that the lair causes just from the dragon living there. Um, uh, it, lair actions do provide uh, how you can run it, how you, how you can run this in terms of uh, initiative order. Uh, for me, when I run them, I just run the lair action immediately after the creature. So like when the dragon does its turn, um, lair action happens, and then the next character and then legendary actions if I choose to do those. Um, it's a lot to take in. You usually run one thing at a time. It uh, Consider lair actions another player. Um, consider lair actions another player in terms of initiative, but they are essentially um, environmental effects from your creature. So it's considered the creature affecting things. It's kind of like a home field advantage for your uh, for your creature. There is one other. There is one other kind of action I want to cover briefly. <clears throat> I want to get a good hand. 
minutes around it though before I dip into it. <clears throat> so. There is a, there is a set of actions out there. Oh, that's strange. That's true, they, they did come later. So there's a, there's a set of actions out there called mythic actions. Mythic actions are mainly used for uh, gods gods and very powerful creatures according to the rules mythic actions are used by creatures that are so rare people doubt their existence um every sap block i'm coming across for these creatures do not have mythic actions <laughs> I'm having some kind of weird glitch here. These things must be fucking rare, because I, I swear if I, I have encountered them and I've used them, but now I can't fucking find them. Alright, well, I, I can't find it, so the gist of Mythic Actions is that they are kind of like a uh, a common theme with mythic actions is that when a, when a creature reaches zero hit points, they burst... Sorry, I just hit my mic. They burst back uh, to full health or a little bit more health, kind of like a second health bar or a second wave. A second phase, I guess. Um, in terms of combat so it's a little it's a little cheaty it's not really because mythic actions are for like your really big bad creatures you should be high level when you encounter creatures that have mythic actions um but not a lot of creatures have it so we're not really going to worry about it so how can you as a dm use these stat blocks um for your own needs you can drag and drop literally anything in and out of these sap blocks. If you want to make this lich easier, let's say for some reason it's a lich that doesn't have a spell casting. Let's just rip that spell casting out. Why? Maybe he's under the effects of a dead magic zone and he just can't use his spells. He can still use paralyzing touch because it's a spell like ability, but not an actual spell. Um, he'll still have his frightening, frightening gaze. Um, disrupt life could be in there. Um, it depends. I would say disrupt life is not a spell, but a spell like ability, but it's also specifically stating that it's magic. So dead magic zone, probably gonna not have his disrupting, disrupt life. Um, What if I want to change the legendary actions? You can do that. Like I said, uh, I think the adult dragon's legendary actions kind of suck. The detect, I can see a use for it. But maybe I want to swap that out for Frightful Presence. Maybe I want to make one of his legendary actions a Fire Breath. I can do that. Um, depending on what it is, <clears throat> as I said earlier, Fire Breath, I would make that like a three action legendary action. Um, and it's still following the same rules as the recharge, just to make it fair. Frightful Presence would be a one action. It's tail attack, same as up here, is a one action. Um... I would not include the multi-attack as, like, an option for the layer attacks, or the legendary actions. 
I wouldn't do that simply because that's a literally two attacks. Um, this most of the tricks here are a one one trick pony. You're doing one thing. Multi attack is not going to go in there. But what if I want to amp up my goblin? What if I want to make this more of a threat? I can do that. So let's say I want it to be a vampiric goblin. So I want to give it Misty Escape. So what you can do, if you're taking notes on these, um, because obviously you can't can't change this. Um, however, I will mention this. I shouldn't have gotten rid of Improved Initiative. What I love about Improved Initiative is that you can come in here. Can I scroll this over? Nope, nope. For some reason, I cannot. Um, but you can come over here, and you can... Let me look up a goblin. So we have a goblin here. I can... Go to add new. I can make an entirely new creature. Or I can go over here and hit this button here. And I can edit that goblin. Still has the same stats. 8, 14, 10, 10, 8, 8. 8, 14, 10, 10, 8, 8. Still same stats. Still a bog standard goblin. But now I can come in here. I can add skills to it. I can change its speed. I can give it a flight speed. If I want to add senses, if I want to give this goblin enhanced dark vision, I can do that. Um, but like I said, I want to give it the Misty Escape. So, I would add that up here. So, let me go to my vampire. I'm just going to highlight all of this. Copy it. And I'll drop Misty Escape. Bam. And now, just so I know, Vampiric Goblin. Save changes. So I have my normal goblin, and now I have my Vampiric Goblin. That's just a feature of improved initiative that I like. If you're taking notes, like for your campaign or your um, your session, uh, something I do to make it easier for myself is I'll just write, uses goblin stat block, has these changes. They can be as simple as that. They don't have to be super in-depth. Whatever is going to work for you. How do I get rid of you? <laughs> This is nice and all. I appreciate it. But how do I... How do I... Okay. Go away now. Okay, you're still there. There we go. I don't know what was going on. But if you want to improve smaller creatures... So I can add the Misty Escape to the Goblin. I can add the Regeneration to the Goblin. I can add Spider Climb to the Goblin. That's going to change this entire dynamic for a goblin. I'm actually kind of surprised Vampira Goblin is not something that's already in a um, combat encounter. Got Chaos Spawn Goblin, Dust Goblin, Dust Goblin Chieftains, Hobgoblin, Shadow Goblin, Bugbear. All of your goblinoids, I know you can't really see them, but that's what's, that's what's listed here in Improved Initiative. So Vampira Goblin could be its own session. Why are these goblins all vampires? Um, you could stay with uh, the normal actions for goblins that they only have a scimitar and a short bow or you could up you could up their uh, their uh, wow brain thanks for going blank on me you can up their uh... oh my god brain you had it and then you lost it again how is that possible 
You can up their threat. Thank you. You can up their threat level by giving them multi-attack and doing the uh, bite or maybe a mix of the bite and one of their scimitar attacks. Honestly, I don't know why we haven't done Vampiric Goblins. Sorry, I'm crashing through everything. So what I'm going to do right now is I'm actually going to keep expanding on this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make this Vampiric Goblin. So let me go to the vampire here and do a little bit of uh, a little bit of homebrewing for you. <clears throat> how I'm going to do it. So goblins already are good at stealth, like vampires are. So we're just going to add the perception bonus to them. So I'm going to go to combat tracker here. Come in here, and we're going to give them perception. And that should be their proficiency. Plus their wisdom? Yes. Their wisdom's a negative one. So they're going to be a plus one. But, since wizards doesn't make any fucking sense here, we're just going to steal the vampires plus seven. So I'm going to make that a seven. <clears throat> um... Speed is still 30 for the vampire. It's still the same for the goblin. We're not going to do too much on that. <clears throat> Senses. We are going to up their dark vision to 120. I think that's all we're really going to do. <clears throat> right? Yeah, 120. I can't read. I'm having real problems today. <clears throat> Resistances, necrotic, bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing from non-magical. We are going to take that and add that into. So damage resistance from bludgeoning. Right, that's how you spell bludgeoning. Slashing, piercing. I can spell. <clears throat> uh, I forget. Let me save this real quick. And add a. So I want to see how they. Okay, well, I added way too many. How did they write this in here? Huh, okay. So, what does that look like for my goblin right now? Vampiric goblin. Okay, so it just it just does that. <clears throat> um, so what we'll do to fix the vampiric is we'll. Where the hell did I go? I skipped over some things. Um, so over here, from non-magical. I'm a little lazy right now. There for non-magical attacks. Um, <clears throat> Goblin is not gonna have much for saving throws so I'm not gonna add anything to it <clears throat> and like you can make this make sense to your to fit your own needs I'm just kind of exploring a vampiric goblin uh, so what do I want to add here from the vampire to the goblin these are the things I would argue will up the CR so a goblin right now is a CR 1-4. I can be extremely honest that the fact that a Misty Escape ups its CR to at least a, a 1 or a 2, just by default. This thing has now become more of a, a problem. Um, so what else do I want to add to it? 
I don't want to give it full shape changer because I don't think a vampiric goblin is a full vampire. Um, I'm not going to give it the legendary resistance. Again, not a full vampire. But I do have the Misty Escape, which means it has some form of vampirism. I will, however, give it the spider climb and we will give it the vampire weaknesses. So, I will grab this for spider climb just to save on time. Grab that. Drop, oop, drop that in. We can. Vampiric Goblin. And change vampire weakness to vampiric weaknesses. Drop the first half in there. I'm just doing little uh, tweaks so that it makes sense. I'm just gonna change this to goblin. Golbin, I can type. So that's everything that we're taking from the vampire in terms of um, its traits and like special actions. What else do we want to add to this? I'm thinking we'll add a multi-attack, which is going to up it from like a CR 1-4 to, I think I see what I said was a CR 1 before. I think this will be easily like a CR 3 now. Because when you start adding multi-attack in, you are going to um, can add some issues to it. So I'm going to take multi-attack. Different actions. Multi-attack. Drop that in. And we're not going to change much there because that actually makes sense. We are not going to give them the unarmed strike. Move the multi attack up. Um, we are going to give them a bite. So we'll drop down here. We'll do the bite. No, mine player. We'll copy all that. Drop it in here. Du -du -du -du. I'm just adding all the extra shit in here to make it nice and professional. Okay. So I am not going to give them the charm. They are goblins. And I'm not going to give them the ability for children of the night. Because I want them to still be kind of base goblins, so they're going to keep nimble escape. Misty escape only happens when they reach uh, zero hit points. Um, and then they will not have any legendary actions. So that is literally everything. So now our vampiric goblin has, scoot this over. Our vampiric goblin is now um, ready to go. They're a bit harder to hit 
They're a bit more hardy, I guess. More of a threat. Uh, the reason I didn't want to change the AC was because um, base goblins still kind of like a 50-50 shot, but you're not going to be super worried. Um, I suppose I could up their health. Probably should, given the fact that how dangerous they are. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give them a plus. I'm not going to give them a plus 68 because that'll that'll just up the CR way too much. Um, but I'm thinking like a plus 13 or a plus 15 for the health. Something that's decent but not too crazy. So I'm going to do plus 15. So there are 7 outright. Plus 15 puts them at 23, I think. If my math is correct. Uh, does it have a CR in here? Yes. Um, I'm going to say a CR 3. Change that. Give that. Boom. We now have a, an entirely new monster. You can drag and drop things in at any time to homebrew. Now, I I was fiddling around with this, so I could have this completely wrong. I just homebrewed this on the spot. I'd have to test it. I'd have to see how it works in combat and all that fun stuff. But honestly, I think it's well-rounded for like just a change to a core creature. A vampiric goblin seems pretty standard. I, I don't think it's too difficult. I wouldn't think it... With with a 15 armor class and only 23 health, you're still killing that relatively quickly. Um, it might be a threat for level 1 parties, but I don't think that'd be too terrible. Um, so, yeah, this has been, you know... An overview of how to read stat blocks um, definitely uh, when you're homebrewing them or want to make changes go by these stat blocks even when you're running a game take a moment to reread them they're not super complex I know when you get into like this that's a lot of shit to read especially like this it's just a lot and liches and mind flares like you can take your time to read those I mean players do the same thing when they're deciding on what the fuck to do in their turns I when, when I was just starting as a DM I got it in my head that I had to like I had to have a solution to the problem of what my characters did as soon as it got to be my turn I can be so much more damaging to them if I read through some of these and I hit them with a well-placed spell or a well-placed attack or, you know, use one of the traits up here to fuck with my players and to throw them off. Like, that, that hurts them and puts them on the back foot more often. And to us, it's more fun. I don't mean to uh, to say, oh well, you gotta you gotta fuck up your players. I mean, when I was when when I was DMing early on, I was just trying to be that they hit me, I hit them, I hit them, they hit me, as as quickly as possible to make uh, combat fun. I think my players have gotten more enjoyment out of um, the bugbear. Uh, stat blocks that I've been using. No, not state block. Stat block. What the fuck is a state block? Yeah. Brute. Melee weapon deals one extra die of its damage. So I've almost never gotten a surprise attack off of the bugbear. This brute trait has fucked my party. This brute trait has royally fucked my party. They have gotten crushed 
by this thing. My veteran DM, who has been playing for at least, like, 10 plus years longer than me, has gotten waylaid by this. Granted, they were taking on, like, three human cultists and two bugbears, but they still got owned. And it was... I was concerned I was about to have a, a total party kill. So, uh, we'll do one quick last overview. Name, type, alignment. Simple stuff. Uh, type, you're going to be uh, referring to this section mainly uh, if anything spe targets a specific type. Aberrations, fiends, undead, uh, celestials. You're going to find that up here. Um, its size is also typed in. I forgot to mention size is right there. Your os, your armor, hit points, and speed. Armor is what should it Armor is what it should be wearing by default. You can change that if you want to specialize it or make it a special NPC. Hit points. What is listed here is always the average. Always average. You can up this by putting the max health on the hit point die. Be careful when you do that. 300 hit point dragon changes the dynamic of your game speed refer to this when their speed is reduced or upped stats would mainly come here for the modifiers if there are effects that affect the score it'll also come here skills and traits well mainly skills what they're good at their senses and passive perception passive perception will always be here languages the common fluff, what they speak. You'll look here to see if they have telepathy or uh, in senses for tremor, sense, true sight, all that fun stuff. Challenge rating, mainly how much XP you're going to get from killing one of them. And proficiency bonus for determining your skills and or passes and whatnot. Um, proficiency bonus for creatures will also be useful if they, for some reason, pick up an item and attune to it or pick up an item and it gives them a boost or makes them proficient in something. I don't know. You, a, a, a campaign or session is going to be wild at any point. Traits. Specific to your creature. Read them. They can change combat. They can change a whole dynamic of an encounter. This one. It's probably my new favorite. In addition to how I use Nimble Escape for Goblins. These little bastards are always hit and run, and my players hate it. I guarantee they love to hate it. Actions. They're standard actions that they will take in combat. Legendary actions. These are attacks and movement options that they will use at the end of another person's turn. Glorified, quote-unquote, reactions. Because they're... I call them glorified reactions because they're taking them at the end of other people's turn, not on their own. So that is the gist of stat blocks. I wanted to go over this because I saw for quite a while that um, people seemed to be kind of intimidated by reading stat blocks. I mean, I if you haven't seen me horribly try to convey how to read these fucking things even i struggle with them you're going to have a little bit of a hard time if you try to rush through it even i do um i forgot to mention some of them have saving throws some creatures have saving throws like the vampire they're gonna be up with the skills i really should have mentioned that i picked goblin as the default when i was writing my notes up for this so the goblin doesn't have any saving throws. The dragon has saving throws. Vampire has saving throws. Strahd has saving throws. So. Innate spellcasting, magic resistance, all that fun stuff. I think that's primarily going to cover it. We did a little bit of homebrewing with our vampiric goblin.
keep having to move this thing over. So when homebrewing something, you can take you can take traits, actions, resistances, you can take anything you want and drop drag it. Drop blah, 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 blah. Oh my god. Drag and drop it in. Oh my god, I need to go to bed. You can drag and drop it in. Take things out. If it doesn't make sense to you, remove it. Try it. See what it does. I don't know. Um, but yeah, that's, that's the long and short of it. If you guys think I missed something or got something wrong, let me know. Um, I know last week I was gone. I, uh, I was not feeling the greatest and dealing with, uh, dealing with some back pain. So I think this is mainly going to cover it though. Stat blocks are not that hard to look over. Um, but, uh, they can be intimidating with a lot of shit to look at especially the vampire the vampire has probably the beefiest stat block out of the entire uh fifth edition group of monsters uh i know another famous one let's look at the tarasque i am twitching like crazy because my nose is driving me insane tarasque look at this bad boy what is this bitch is a CR30. They say it cannot be killed. That is not true. It is immune to fire, poison, bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing from non-magical. You can kill it with, you know... I mean, you can hurt it from things that are not fire and poison and, you know, have magical weapons. Um... trying to think like where does it actually say that this thing cannot be outright killed it has 676 health if you're fighting this thing you done fucked up or you are at the end of a campaign and really trying to test your skills let's see here where does it say it outright cannot be killed Anytime the Tarrasque is targeted by a magic missile on one or a five, the Tarrasque is unaffected. On a six, the Tarrasque is unaffected, and the effect is reflected back at the caster. I'm not seeing anything that says this thing cannot outright be killed. Can the Tarrasque killed <clears throat> you must reduce its hit points to negative 30 and then cast wish so are they because it's also telling me it has regeneration this does not have regeneration on it Is there a basic rules 2014 <laughs> sheer power absolute unit the true king of the beasts <laughs> they will love my one shot I'm getting distracted I think they're referring to a 3.5 Tarask Tarask can't be permanently killed unless you cast wish or miracle over its remains like I agree but I'm not seeing its sap block here does not have regeneration it doesn't have regeneration does that mean someone changed it What, what happened here? I think we discovered a glitch in the matrix. You're telling me that it has regeneration, 
and, and, and imposing presence. He's got frightful presence. Rush can move at 150 feet. Where is its speed? I think they changed this. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Give me the terrestrial stat block. Give me something that's not D and D Beyond. Are they referring to? They have to be referring to three point five. What? I'm sorry, maybe I just never took a close enough look at the terrasse, because it says it has regeneration. Where is regeneration on this thing? It has legendary resistance, magic resistance, reflective carapace, siege monster. Where the fuck is... Where the fuck is regeneration? Monster manual in here? Hang on. Hang on, hang on. No, we're gonna get to the bottom of this. I feel like I've discovered some kind of conspiracy. I feel like I have just come across a fucking tragedy that they tried to cover up. Where's my Tarask? I have the physical book right here in my hand. Shield baby six. There you are, you god of a beast. Yeah, no, there is no there is no confirmed regeneration. And they're also telling me this thing moves at like 150 feet per turn. It says right here this bitch moves at 40. The legendary Tarrasque is possibly the most dreaded monster of the material plane. It is widely believed that only one of these creatures exists, though no one can predict where and when it will strike. A scaly biped, the Tarrasque is 50 feet tall and 70 feet long. Weighing hundreds of tons, it carries itself like a bird of prey, leaning forward and using its powerful lashing tail for balance. Its cavernous maw yawns wide enough to swallow all but the largest creatures, and so great is its hunger, it can devour the populations of whole towns. Legendary destruction. The destructive potential of the Tarrasque is so vast that some cultures incorporate the monster into religious doctrine weaving its sporadic appearance into stories of divine judgment and wrath. Legends tell of how the Tarrasque slumbers in its secret lair beneath the earth, remaining in a dormant state for decades or centuries. When it awakens in answer to some inscrutable cosmic call, it rises from the depths to obliterate everything in its path. Yeah, and then the next page is the fucking Thrykreen. And the page before that is the succubus and incubus. You don't have it. Where the fuck? Where did you get off? What did they do to my boy? I feel like I have been betrayed. Am I going crazy? What is happening here? I am all, like... I'm all fine with believing that the Tarrasque cannot be outright killed and you have to cast Wish on it. But that's not blatantly stated in its, in its stat block. That is not... That's not stated. I'm sorry, now I'm, now I'm going down a rabbit hole. This is bothering me. If it's not on the stat block, as a rules lawyer, you could sit here and be like, uh, actually, you can't kill it. <sighs> like, 
I'm checking the stat block to see if there's any indication that it just literally cannot outright be killed. Like, yeah, 676 health. You're not killing this thing easily. It's gonna be a hell of a fight. And if you max health this bastard, you're looking at 990 hit points to cleave through. I just... Okay, so I'm not the only one who saw this. I I'm looking at it on Reddit. Trask is a disaster, not a boss. Um... I'll be using the 5e stat block, which is the one I've heard the most complaints about. Furthermore, you shouldn't run the Tarrasque unless you and your party are prepared. Um, this Tarrasque offers nothing as a unique boss fight, only a huge pool of hit points and immunity to many, many spells. Yeah. Um... I'm sorry to have gone so far off the rails, but it, I just, I wanted to, like, showcase, like, a, a popular monster and realize, like, oh, yeah, you, you could only kill it with Wish. And then it's like, it doesn't have regeneration. It doesn't outright state you have to kill it with Wish. Not even, not even the monster manual states it. It just is, like, hyping it up. It bothers the fuck out of me. Because that means rules is written... You don't need to cast Wish to kill this thing. You can kill it without casting Wish. <clears throat> kind of disappointed. It's supposed to be a plague on the material plane, not something you can just kill and be done with. Okay. Yeah, one of the DM uh, responses was that it's supposed to be, like, it's supposed to be something that is, like, essential to the material plane, which is why you have to cast Wish on it. My problem is, without that being outright stated, any player can look at this stat block and say, well, it doesn't say you have to cast Wish on it to kill it. Or maybe I'm not looking. I present swallow. I I see nothing that says it cannot. I I see nothing in this stat block that says it has to be killed with the use of a wish spell. So, technically, according to the stat block and its own entry in the monster manual. You can kill a Tarrasque without casting Wish. It's going to be a hell of a fight. But, you can do it. And I guess that's my controversial statement of the day. Because I... I feel like I've discovered a crime. <laughs> For the longest time, we all joked, oh, you have to cast Wish to kill a Tarrasque. You have to, you know, get it under so much to kill the Tarrasque. And it can't be charmed, frightened, paralyzed, or poisoned. It's got blind sense up to 120 feet. All right. Well, I'm done going off the, uh, off the rails. Um... This has been fun, uh, even though I can't convey things easily today. Um, I'm going to call it now, and um, I will be back tomorrow with another uh, GM session. We're going to be going over uh, making encounters for your sessions. So I'm looking forward to that. We'll build an encounter, and uh, I think we'll have a lot of fun there. But... Thank you all so much for watching and tuning in. Um, the VOD for this will be going up on YouTube later today. Um, if you enjoyed, uh, follow me, I guess. I, I'm not familiar with Twitch. So um, 
if you're on YouTube, go ahead and hit subscribe if you like this stuff. Um, so yeah, thank you so much, and uh, I'll see you tomorrow. Have a good day, guys.